All right, if you have your Bibles, take a look at Philippians chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 5 through 11. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Again, this is, this is probably one of the, the most beautiful passages in Scripture. We think of God's Word. Uh, no book ever has, has expressed things as beautiful as God's Word, as, as, as the Bible. You have religious books. You have wonderful literature. Uh, if you walk through my office, you'll see, uh, you'll see bookshelves. Don't ask me if I've read all the books, but you'll see bookshelves upon bookshelves. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a book guy. I love books. I love great literature, and nothing as beautiful as some books are, nothing compares to what Scripture has to say. And this passage is one of those most beautiful passages. I, I, I appreciate Valerie in picking songs because, I mean, pretty much 90% of my message was preached during those songs. But um, it's powerful who Christ is, talking about who Christ is. So Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, Paul says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you again. We thank you for this service. We thank you for the songs we could sing praising Christ's name. We thank you for the missionary update and and just everything that that as we come together, even the, 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 the beautiful weather, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy, your gifts, your faithfulness. We pray now that that. You would focus our minds, help us to look at this passage for the next few moments, and help us to walk out of here, Lord, with a, 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 re, a renewed, a refreshed sense of who you are. Fill us with joy that this is our God, this is our Savior. And I pray that you would, you would encourage us to share this gospel. I pray for any who have not trusted you as we, as we explore who this Jesus is, just what he did and, and who he is. I pray that you would open their hearts. Uh, change their heart of stone into a heart of flesh and let them come to you in humble repentance. We ask you to be with our children as we dismiss them. We pray that you would um, give the teachers wisdom as, as they teach and, and, and present your word to them on, to the kids on their, their age level. We pray that you would again open their, their hearts and, and, and sink that, that seed of the gospel deeply into their hearts. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, the children can be dismissed. So I knew uh, I knew we were going to have some extra things today, so I didn't even wear a watch. So I don't know if anyone else did, but I didn't. I just left it at home. No. Uh, so, so in our passage last week, we began unpacking Paul's call to Christian unity. And you know the, notice the title of this message is, is uh, uh, Christian Unity Through Christ's Example Part 2. And honestly, last week, we didn't really get into Christ's example. That's this week. Uh, last week, we talked about the methods and the marks of Christian unity, uh, the motives of Christian unity, unity within the church. And this week, we're going to examine our model for unity, Christ himself, Jesus himself. And again, this is one of the most beautiful passages in all of Scripture. In these few verses, we get a glimpse into Jesus' character. Now, you could argue that the entirety of the Bible reveals God's character, and, it, and that is very true. And we read through the Gospels and we see, uh, the, some, in some cases, the daily behaviors of Christ. But man, Paul distills it into this verse. We see the, 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 the deepest intimacy of, of who Christ was, how Christ o- operated within this passage. We see a person. And in my notes, I have a capital P, person. Sometimes we think of... Uh, we, we think of God as a force, as a, uh, an impersonal force. And that's not the God that's described in the Bible. God is a person. He's not a, not a, not a sinful human, but he's a person. He, he has personality. And in Christ, we see a person who rightfully can enjoy unlimited glory and praise. He has every right to it. 
Christ has every right to every being, everything in creation, praising him 24-7. He has the right to it. Yet, he sets it aside. He clothes himself in humiliation. And all for the sake of rebels who are at war with him. You know, we like to say that Christ took our place in the cross, and certainly he did. But oftentimes, we, we sanitize what we are, who we are. Jesus died for me, but that, that, I'm a pretty good guy. He didn't die for pretty good guys. Christ took on humiliation for the sake of rebels at war with him. Sinners lost in our, in our, in our wickedness. This is why we preach Christ. This is why we seek always to point people to Christ. Maybe you've noticed our songs. Our, our songs are about Christ, about who God is. It's, it's praising his name. This is why everything points to Christ. Good works can't save. I, I could get up here on a, on a weekly basis and, and preach about don't lie and don't steal and don't do those things. And those are all true. But even if you don't lie, don't steal, don't... don't uh, you know, do some of those other things. Good works can't save you. Had a pastor tell me once that um, if, if your sermon could be preached in a synagogue or in a mosque, you're doing something wrong, right? Because even though all the world religions would, would generally agree that lying is wrong and stealing is wrong and murdering is wrong, the gospel is unique in preaching Christ, only Christ. And so our passages, our, our sermons, our songs point to Christ. And this is why. Because he deserves it. Good works can't save. Famous Christian personalities can't save. We all got our favorite authors or favorite preachers on TV. They can't save you. Only faith in Christ. Willingly, Christ willingly humiliated on the cross, willing to take my punishment. Only faith in that Christ can save. That's why we point people to Christ. That's why we, we, everything points at Christ. So as we talk about Christian unity, unity within the church, unity requires humility. Pride destroys unity because we each only look out for ourselves. Once we start getting arrogant, once we start building up pride, once I start thinking that this is my kingdom, and what Cindy said earlier is very, very true, this is an Allen's church. I know sometimes when we talk about pastors and churches, I've, I've had pastors talk about, oh, that's, 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 that's Pastor you know, Jones's church. And sometimes we use those, those terms just because I know the guy but not the area. But I want to be careful of that. This isn't my church. This is Christ's church. It's not your church either, right? It's Christ's church. We get to participate, but this place belongs to Christ. Unity requires humility. We, we can't allow that, that seed of pride to build up because that de destroys unity. Jesus is the great example of unity, the great example of humility. He set the needs of lost sinners before his. He had every right to be praised and glorified through eternity, and yet he set it aside, empties himself, that's what Paul says, because we needed a savior. We can't earn our own salvation. We have no way of, of, of reconnecting with God. If we're going to be saved, we needed a Savior. And Christ, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but Christ didn't just humble, but humiliated himself to provide that. For the next few minutes, we're going to look at Jesus Christ, our example for Christian unity. We're going to, we're going to go through it relatively quickly here. But this is, this is big. So he, he starts out in verse 5. He says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So literally it means follow this example. And for a Christian, the word Christian literally means Christ follower or little Christ. I mean, it, was a, it, it started out being an insult. Oh, they're Christians. They follow this Christ guy. And we think of that as, oh, that's, that's an, a, an honorable name, except in, in first century Roman culture, they mocked Christians. That was an insult. You idiots, we killed your guy. There's actually some, uh, there's in, in, I think it's in the city of Rome. I have, to, I have to look at it again, but there's some graffiti written on a wall, ancient graffiti. Somebody scratched into a wall. It was a, a person on a cross with a, with a uh, donkey's head. 
And underneath it, it says, I can't remember the, the, the person's name, but it says he's worshiping his God. And it was a, it was a, a graffiti, 2,000-year-old graffiti mocking Christ. It's incredible. Um, you know, and as we would say, like, that's, that's horrible, but man, they knew. They knew who Christ was. And, and Christ followers were facing that all the way back then. We, we sometimes fear, you know, what's this culture going to do? How's the culture going to change and turn on us? And oh, man. And, and we know that in, in, in Canada, there's a couple pastors that have, have been sent to jail because, you know, for the audacity of meeting together. And sometimes we're worried about it. And it's an encouragement, though know that 2,000 years ago there was a Christian who was willing to be mocked, a, a Christian who was willing to, to, to face hostility because he was worshiping his God. So have this mind. Follow this example. Actually follow Christ. What's fascinating is he says, which is yours in Christ. Salvation brings a newness of life, a changed life, a changed heart. With this change comes the ability to follow Christ's example. The lost can't. A lost man can't follow Christ's example. A lost man can be good, can, can, can in, in the world standards, can be a good guy, can pay his bills, can take care of his families. But to actually follow Christ's example, that requires the indwelling Holy Spirit. That requires a change of nature. So this following comes because of your faith in Christ. Again, Paul doesn't tell us, be good so you can earn your salvation. He says, because you're saved, because, because you put your faith in Christ, now you can follow his example. Now, the next few verses, verses 6 through 11, are poetic. It, it's fascinating. It, it might be a pre-Pauline hymn that, that Paul incorporates into his letter. It might have been... More likely, it was written by Paul himself, but we do know that, that in other areas of his writings, Paul mentions Christian doctrine that predated his salvation because Christianity didn't start with Paul. Uh, the church didn't start with, with Paul. And so, so Paul does mention, hey, this is what I received. This was what I was taught. So this passage is seems like a like a hymn, like like perhaps the early church would have sang these words. There's a there's a poetic lilt to it. It's lost a little bit in English, but as we read it, we you know we recognize the beauty of it. It's, a, it's an incredible thing. So let's jump right in. He he says, have this mindset, have follow this example. Well, what's the example? Well, verse six starts out. We see in Jesus' humiliation, he took off his glory. So we, are, we, we, we break this passage into two parts. We see Christ's humiliation, and then we see Christ's exaltation. But we see, how, how did Christ humiliate himself? Well, he took off his glory. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. This, this being, this, this person who, who owns glory, willingly took it off. Willingly let it go. You ever have that, that favorite jacket or that favorite article of clothing? And, and I wear, my, my kids you know, have, a, have a thing, you know, a sweater or a jacket or something they wear every day. And you're like, you got to take that thing off. It's, gonna, you know, it's walking around by itself. It needs to be laundered. But they don't want to wear it. Always time. It's mine. It's mine. I don't want to give it up. Well, Christ took this glory and gave it up. It says he's in the form of God. The Greek, the Greek phrase that, that's translated as form of God is morphe theo. So morph, morphe, we get in English, we have that, that kind of word. We recognize that. But morphe theo, it means in the very image or nature or glory of God. Some, some cult groups and, and, and uh, uh, apostate groups will take, take this phrase and, and, and say, well, he was in the form of God. He just kind of looked like God, but he isn't God. But that's not what the phrase means. The phrase means he, he is literally in the very nature of God. It doesn't mean that Jesus merely looked like God, but that he shares the very nature, the very essence of God. That's big. Christ is God. And, and he owns everything that comes with being God. It says he does not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now this phrase, uh, a thing to be grasped, this is the only time in the New Testament this phrase is used in the Greek. And so it can be difficult. 
And I remember, I think our adult Sunday school class, what do you spend, eight weeks? <laughs> I think we went through eight, it was, it, was a, it was a deep study that, that Robert went through examining the Greek of it. And, and I'm not going to spend that much time today, but suffice to be said, this, doesn't, this isn't talking about a thing to be uh, grasped bad. Like you think of something you're trying to grab and reach for and you can't quite reach it. Something on the top shelf. Right? I, have, I have a bunch of short people in my house and they're always, I actually have, I have gum because my kids eat all my gum. They just go right through my gum. So I buy gum and I put it on the top shelf and they can't even see it. But they, if they know it's there, I'll, kind of, I'll find them on the counter and they'll be like looking. But, you know, this picture of something up high that I can't quite reach, that's not what this is talking about. This phrase means a thing to be held, a thing to be exploited. He didn't think that, that being equal with God was a thing to be held on to. The King James says he thought it not robbery. And I think that's, that's a, uh, maybe an archaic phrase, but it's a good one. It wasn't robbery because he already owns it. Jesus isn't trying to be like God. Now, we look at the Old Testament. We see in, the, in what is Isaiah 14 where, with the fall of Lucifer. Well, what's he do? He wants to sit on God's throne. He wants to take that. It's not his. Sitting on God's throne wasn't his to have. When he, when he uh, uh, tempts Adam and Eve, he says, you'll be like God. Eat this piece of fruit and you can, you can have that role. It's not, not theirs to have. But for Christ, it is. This is his role. That, that throne is his. That glory is his. But even though he owns it, even though he has every right to it, the scripture goes on, he emptied himself. Now, this is where many Bible students go off the rails. They're talking about emptying. Uh, he, some, some would say he emptied himself of his godness. Um, and that's not what the scripture's saying. One thing we have to remember is that Paul isn't, his point in this passage isn't to give a, a uh, exhaustive treaties on the deity of Christ. Now, I think it's there and you can see it, but that's not his point. He, the point that Paul is making here is that Christ was willing to set aside the, the, the rights and privileges. He humbled himself. He humiliated himself. So we got to make sure that we understand that. But we, under, but we need to understand that Jesus didn't empty himself of his godhood. He didn't become less than God. When your very nature is godhood, is deity, how can you not be that? He, he can't give up his godness. But what he did was set aside his glory, his praise, his majesty. He lived in submission to his father. A being, a person who needs to bow the knee to no one, willingly lived in submission to his father. This is the first part of Jesus' example. He set aside his rights, his privileges for the sake of men and women who were in active rebellion against him. Now think about that for a moment. He set aside his rights. And we live in a culture right now of, of, of we, we, we live in, a, 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 in the middle of culture wars, political and, and cultural issues. And one of our big challenges as Americans many times is, whoa, I don't want to give up my rights. I have a right to this. And, and to some extent, that's true. If I do this, if I acquiesce to this, I'm going to lose my rights. And there might be some truth to that. But what we see in the example of our, our Savior is a willingness. I can set aside my rights. I can set aside my privileges because I trust the one who sent me. So he took off his glory. Now, setting aside rights, setting aside his glory is tough enough. But then Jesus put on humiliation. He takes off his glory. He puts on humiliation. Verse 7b says, By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man and being found in human form, Jesus takes on humanity. He didn't look like us. He became one of us. That phrase, form of, form of a servant, literally means a slave. The Greek is doulos. It's a, it's a slave. Paul uses that phrase m multiple times. He talks about being a slave of Christ. Uh, he even talks about being an under rower. You know, that was a, just a, a particularly horrible slavery in the Roman Empire. But he says that Jesus took on the form of, this, of a slave. Being born in the likeness of men, 
being found in human form. Now, this isn't very complimentary to humanity, right? This is not, we, we like to be praised. We like to be, be complimented. He's not complimenting. He became one of us as a slave. Uh, and this is interesting because certainly we understand. There's a couple, con- a couple ideas about this slavery idea. Now, first of all, God created us to experience and enjoy his glory. That's, that's why we were made. God didn't create us to crush us under his heel or grind us under his thumb. He created us so we could experience his glory. We could, we could sh- participate in that. Not that we could have his glory and be worshipped, but that we could worship him and, and experience it. But God created us for himself. In our, our youth group on Wednesday night, one of, our, one of our, our statements was, God is for God. God is for his name. He, his name is, is holy. His name is above all. So God created us to, to, to participate, to, to experience that in worship. But we were created for God. When we set ourselves apart, like I'm going to be autonomous, I'm going to, I, I can be king myself. Well, we were never designed to be autonomous. We were never designed to be sovereign apart from God. Hey, thanks God for making me, but I'm going to go do this over here. That's not what, how we were designed. We were designed to be submissive to God. Again, our pride rankles at that. That's how we were created. Now what we find is in our fallen state, we're slaves to sin. As a sinner, see, Adam and Eve, before they ate the piece of fruit, they were, they were, they were subject to God. God gave Adam the, the call to subdue the earth and to, to rule the earth, but to rule the earth in God's name. As they sin, as they eat the piece of fruit, that, sl- that, that, that ownership changes. They're no longer God's servants, God's slaves, God's property. Now they become slaves of sin. And every human generation since have been, are born slaves to sin. We're bound to it with unbreakable chains. I can't stop being a slave to sin. Only God, only Christ can break those chains. So we see this this servanthood, this slavery. While not taking on sin nature, Christ accepted everything that being a human means. This is big. This is one of those things as as we got to work through, as you think through this, this should, as we leave the, as we leave today, just having that, this understanding that, that Christ accepted all of it. Everything that being a human means. So not the sin nature, but he was willing to be hungry. We see moments when he's hungry. We see moments where he's tired. We see moments where he's in pain. There's natural limitations. He's walking on roads in sandals, right? He's, 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 he's going through those, those things, even the, just the daily grind. We've talked, uh, I think at Christmas time, we talked a little bit about Joseph, Jesus's, for lack of a better term, stepfather. And he's, he's absent in Jesus's adult life. And what we know about Joseph is he's a godly man. He didn't abandon his family. He probably died. Jesus took on the, the ability, the, the willingness to lose loved ones. We see him standing before Lazarus's tomb and he's weeping. Jesus knows he's able and he's going to, to raise Lazarus, but yet he sees the result of sin. Sin damages, sin hurts, it causes pain. And these are the people he loved. And Jesus was willing to take this all on. This phrase being found in human form, it literally means he shared in humanness. I think that's beautiful. He shared in humanness. He didn't pretend to be human. He fully embraced being human. And for us, we know no better. Like, okay, that's great. What, what could be better than being a person? I would not volunteer. We have a pet dog. I would, I would not volunteer to, to be a dog because the, the limitations are, you know, no. I would not volunteer to be a baby again. Give up the ability to walk and talk and clean myself and take care of myself. I wouldn't give that up. Yet Christ gives up so much more. In Luke 2.52, uh, this is one of those Christmas verses. You know, we, Luke 2 talks about the birth of Christ, but Luke 2.52 says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. 
And sometimes we read that through and go, okay, God learned. How does God learn? How does, how does the omnipotent God grow in wisdom? This is part of the setting aside. He didn't stop being God. He didn't, he didn't lose his attributes, but he masked them or set them aside, however you want to word that, so that Jesus grew. Could you imagine? And, and, and again, I don't want to get derailed here, but okay, so Jesus is born as a baby in this manger poor family not even a king's son you know not even not even in a palace he's he's born to a poor family in a wide spot in the road town i uh, remember nazareth wasn't even on maps Scient- uh, anthropologists or whoever they, they they didn't know how old nazareth was because it didn't wasn't on ancient maps and they find out well it was so unimportant people just didn't put it on there <laughs> it doesn't even matter but can you imagine this, this, this person grump? At what point does Jesus, and the Bible doesn't really give us the details, so maybe it's a good question, but we won't go too deeply into it. At what point did Jesus wake up and realize what his goal was, what his purpose was? He, he learns, he grows, his mind expands, his body, he gets bigger and stronger and, and he, he grows. But at what point did he realize, I'm the sacrifice? Did he, did he come to uh, the Passover some, some year, and as they, they're sacrificing the Passover lamb, he recognized, that's me. This is what Christ did for us. He sets aside his glory. He puts on humiliation. And I use the word humiliation because humble doesn't seem to be strong enough. It doesn't. You know, we, 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 we've sanitized humble. He put on humiliation. He set aside his glory and praise to walk in one of these broken bodies among broken people in a broken world. He willingly did this. I'm not sure I love anyone enough to give up what Jesus gave up and put on what Jesus put on. I would love to say so. I'd love to say I'd do anything for my children. But when you start understanding exactly what Jesus did for us, I I don't know if I'm capable of that. That's who this Christ is. He put on humiliation. But his example goes even farther. He submitted to God's will. Uh, 8b says he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And this is where Jesus' example, I think, hits the hardest. As, as, as hard as this idea of putting on humiliation is, I think this is even harder. He submitted and obeyed God, not once, but always. Where Adam failed, Christ succeeded. Where each one of us fail, Christ succeeded. He obeyed in the little things, but yet he also obeyed in the things that we can't even comprehend. Romans 5.19 says, uh, uh, For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Where Adam fails, Christ succeeds. But sometimes we think, uh, you know, that was probably easier. You know, Christ didn't have the sin nature. He didn't have this natural draw to sin. We have this inherent want to do wrong. Our moral compass wants, doesn't want to go north. <laughs> it wants to go to sin. You know, the S isn't south, it's sin. That's, we, we have this drive to go, to, 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 to do wrong. And Christ didn't have that. So maybe we think, well, that was easy. It was easier for Jesus. He didn't suffer with the same lusts and, and same desires as, as we do. So it was, it was easier somehow. Well, Hebrews 4.15 says, We do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Don't think you're going through something that Christ didn't go through. Don't go through something where, don't think that you're going through something that that Christ is like, oh, well, you know, we didn't didn't have internet in my day, so I don't know. We didn't have this or we didn't have that. Christ walked the same, in essence, the same life you and I have walked, yet without sin. But Jesus didn't just face our daily temptations and struggles. He was called to face down God's judgment God's punishment for sin. Take the full measure of God's righteous wrath in our place. 
I can't even imagine being called to do that. I can't even imagine. I mean, a, two years ago, uh, uh, God started working in our, in our family, and, and we knew it was time to step away from where we were and to, to, to look for a new ministry, and then Prairie reached out, and, and through all the details there, we recognized God was moving us from where we were to, to here, and that was hard enough. Picking up, picking up roots and, 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 and obeying God in that. It had been easy just to kind of stay, you know, inertia, stay where we're at. That's hard enough. But to know God has called you to take the, the, the punishment for the sins of the world, this is what Christ was called to. We see him in Gethsemane struggling with obedience. And again, this is, this is beautiful. This is a beautiful thing. Because Christ didn't walk through life as a stoic, you know, robot, just walking through life doing, you know, predetermined things. In Gethsemane, he's battling, he's struggling, he's grappling with obedience. You ever been in prayer and you, maybe you want to do something wrong or you've done, and you, you, you just, you're grappling with God. God, help me, I, I, I want to serve you, but I can't. You know, the, the, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak, Peter says. Maybe we found ourselves in those kind of, those situations this is, what, this is where Christ finds himself. Luke 22, 41, 42 says, And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. In this same passage, a couple verses down, you see him, he, he's, he's sweating blood. The, I mean, the, the stress is such that the capillaries are breaking and, he's, and blood is e uh, 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 oozing or seeping out of his pores. Christ is facing a thing that we can't even imagine, yet he obeys God. Not because this would be fun. Not because, not because this is going to be easy and peasy and no big deal. It's necessary if, it, it, for us. It's not necessarily for him. But for, if we're going to have any hope, this is what Christ does. Jesus faced God's wrath so that you wouldn't have to. His obedience opens the door of hope for mankind. Through faith, through trust in Christ's name, we can be saved. And only through faith in Christ's name. Adoption, restoration only comes through faith in Christ's name. So we see these three things that Christ did, this example. He, he set aside his glory. He put on humiliation. He submitted to God's will. Set aside his rights, being willing to endure humiliation, submitting to God's call. From the, uh, he's the model for Christians to follow. But Jesus' example doesn't end in humiliation and suffering. And that's encouraging. Right? The, the example of Christ doesn't end in the grave. He dies on Friday. He's, he's resurrected on Sunday. The story doesn't end with the crucifixion. Jesus' example ends in exaltation. Verses 9 through 11 talk about Jesus' exaltation. Uh, verse 9, he was given the highest honor. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. That word therefore is huge. It means for this reason. So we've looked at Christ's humiliation. And because of that, because of his willingness to set aside his rights to take on human flesh, God has exalted him. God has honored him, raised him up to the highest rank. That's what highly exalted means. Supreme majesty. I love the songs we sing. We sing about Christ's name, but, but no human song can approach the glory that Christ deserves. Revelation 5, 11 and 12, you get this picture of heaven. The writer says, I looked and I heard around the throne and the, the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. This is the song around the throne. This is who this Christ is. He's worthy. He has the name that's above all names. We think of his names. Jesus, God saves. 
Christ, the anointed one, the promised one. Lord means master or owner. Even when he, he says, I am, the, the I am statements in John, you know, going back to Yahweh, the one who is. This is how we need to see Christ. This is how we need to recognize Christ. We need to see Christ as worthy. He, 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 he humbled himself to provide a way of salvation. Now he's exalted, and we need to recognize him as such. Jesus isn't my buddy. Scriptures talk about my a friend. You know, Jesus is our friend. But oftentimes, you know, we, we twist things. Jesus is my pal. He's, he's cool. You know, eh, I'm going to go do this thing. I know, I know it's not biblical, but Jesus and I are cool. No, Jesus is not your buddy. Jesus is the exalted king of the universe. Jesus isn't your boyfriend. Uh, sometimes you listen to the radio and, and you get these Jesus is my boyfriend songs, and they don't really, it's kind of a joke, but, you know, when you talk about Jesus, like, like if, if you took out Jesus' name and, and you wouldn't know if the song was about a, a romantic relationship or not. No, Jesus is not my boyfriend. Jesus isn't my co-pilot. When I was a kid, that was a popular uh, uh, vanity plate on your car. Jesus is my co-pilot. No, he's not. He's not your co-pilot. Jesus isn't just hanging out here going, hey, I just want to hang out with you. Jesus isn't a Facebook friend who just wants you to give him a thumbs up. Jesus is the undisputed sovereign king of the universe. Credits are rolling. That's what that was. <laughs> we're, we're, we're almost done. We're almost done. But Jesus is the king of the universe. If we want to be a church, if we're going to be a church that impacts our community, we have to see Jesus for what he is. Because I am not going to go out of my way to, to evangelize a world for my buddy, for my co-pilot. I'm not. The king of the universe, that's a different thing. Okay, we have to see Christ for who he is. Christ is worthy of honor and glory. He's worthy of our submission and obedience. So he was given the highest honor. He will be recognized as Lord. Verse 10 says, So that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now this part of Christ's exaltation is yet to be fully realized. Not every knee has bowed. Not every tongue has confessed. Many have. Many have bowed the knee to Christ as Lord. I think we, we, we're in a congregation where most everyone has, has bowed the knee, has confessed Christ as Lord, has, has, has trusted Christ as Savior. But not, maybe not everyone, even in this room. But certainly not everyone in this community. But it's coming. In our youth program, we were talking about, uh, talking about building a worldview. This last Wednesday, we, we talked about God's kingdom as both now and not yet. Christ is king. Christ rose from the dead. He is king. His kingdom is here. We bow the knee and we recognize him as king, but he hasn't come in judgment. And what we do at this moment, we live in this gap between the promise of salvation and the curse of judgment. And we have that we're in this beautiful sweet spot. Our job is to be ambassadors for Christ, to share that gospel, to live out that gospel, drawing people to Christ. Because there will come a moment when this window shuts and the time of salvation is past. The time of judgment has come. Many have bowed the knee to Christ as Lord. But everyone's going to bow the knee, and the Bible's clear. We can bow to Jesus in redeeming faith or in damning judgment. There's no middle ground. When the king comes, his servants are going to bow in, reverent, in reverence and, and love at his salvation, and his enemies are going to bow in submission and be, and be cast away. There's no middle ground. And there's no second chance beyond this life. But this is who this Christ is. He, his name, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. And finally, we see that this exalted Jesus does the very same thing we're called to. He brings glory to God. 11b, the end of our passage here, to the glory of God the Father. So God created humans to experience and enjoy his glory, praising him 
for it. This is the model that Jesus gives us. In his humiliation and exaltation, he magnifies the Father. He brings glory to God. 1 Corinthians 15 uh, mirrors what Paul said in this statement, in this passage. It says, For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it's plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, to Christ, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. And this is another, this, Paul's intellect is dizzy. And when, when Paul writes, and when, he, when he's putting a logical argument together, it's, it's, it's dizzying. It's incredible. But the picture we see here is of this exalted Christ, the Lord. Every knee is going to bow to Christ. And at that point, when Christ could, you know, if you're going to honor me, a man, I'm going to take that. But he's going to relinquish that honor and submit himself to the Father willingly give up again give up that which he has every right to even in exaltation christ is willing to submit for the glory of god and that's our call we're called to glorify god everything we do we look at this example of christ we 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 as, as we study this passage we see a christ who's worth worshiping a christ who's worth spending our life's energy advancing but we also see the model of how, how do we do this? How do we glorify God the way Christ did? So as we close today, I want to challenge you. In a moment, we're going to have the piano play. But I want you to recognize this, that Jesus is the example of Christian unity. He set aside his rights and privileges to accept humiliation in fulfilling God's will for salvation. He's the example we should be striving to follow. But how often do we simply choose not to? How often do we decide, I'm not going to do that? Maybe we won't put it in words, but we think it. Do we think we're better than Jesus? Again, none of us would say that. None of us would, would you say those words, that I'm better than Jesus, but our actions betray us sometimes. He obeyed, but I don't need to. His, his life revolved around submitting to God's will and glorifying God, but I don't need to. That's a challenge. So Christian, when, when Karen comes up and begins to play, I want you to ask God to search your heart. Ask him to bring conviction for pride in your life. I want you to confess it to God. I want, to ask, I want you to ask forgiveness, uh, uh, ask for wisdom and strength to live in this humble unity with God's people following this example of Christ. If you're here and you've never trusted Jesus as Savior, we've talked about him. He's the humble Savior who took your sin on the cross. He's also the exalted King. He's Lord. And all will bend the knee to him. Would you bow to him in repentance today? Would you trust him for salvation today? Or would you wait to kneel to him in judgment? Place your faith in him today. There's no magic prayer. There's no, there's no uh, secret spell or incantation. It's just speaking to God. Repent of your sin. Ask for forgiveness. Trust him for salvation. We'll take a moment, we'll, Karen will play through a verse of our closing song, and then we'll close in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we, we come before you. We thank you for this passage, this, this beautiful passage talking about the example of Christ, who Christ is, what he was willing to do to provide us salvation, what he was willing to do for, for rebels, for, for, for his enemies. 
we thank you for that. We thank you for, for miraculously uh, uh, opening our eyes and, and, and bringing us to faith in Christ. I pray that we would be a people who follow Christ's example, are truly Christian in our worldview, truly Christ followers in our, in our daily lives. I pray that you would, you would open our hearts and, and convict us of a sin. Let us see those seeds of pride that have grown up, those, those seeds of complacency that, that, that we don't need to obey, we don't need to follow. I pray that you would purge us of those and let us be a people that actively looks for ways to proclaim this, this worthy Christ. I pray for those who, who have not trusted you. I pray that you would again open their eyes and hearts Bring them to faith. Let them see who this Christ is. He was willing to set aside his rights, his privileges, his honor and glory and take on human flesh to provide a way of salvation. He's worthy of our trust. And I pray that you would bring any, un, any lost people into faith. We pray now as we, as we, as we close our service, I, I pray, as, as we mentioned earlier about the, the Leonard family, we pray for Jackson and uh, we pray for his family and, and, and the families of, of those who, who were lost. And we pray that you would help us to, to be able to minister. We thank you for the privilege of participating in ministry. But we pray that, that we could be a church that glorifies your name, that helps to bring healing and, and hope, not just to those families, but to this entire community. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.